Please turn, our, please turn your Bibles to John chapter 12. And we'll be reading verses 34 through 43. John chapter 12, verses 34 through 43. John chapter 12, verse 34. The crowd then answered him, We have heard out of the law that the Christ is to remain forever. And how can you say the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? So Jesus said to them, For a little while longer light is among you. Walk while you have the light, so that darkness will not overtake you. He who walks in the darkness does not know where he goes. While you have the light, believe in the light, so that you may become sons, you may become sons of light. These things Jesus spoke, and he went away, he went away and hid himself from them. But though he had performed so many signs before them, yet they were not believing in him. This was to fulfill the word of Isaiah the prophet, which he spoke, Lord, who has believed our report, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For this reason they could not believe. For Isaiah said again, He has blinded their eyes, and he hardened their heart, so that they will not see with their eyes, and perceive with their heart, and be converted, and I heal them. These things Isaiah said, because he saw his glory, and he spoke of him. Nevertheless, many even of the rulers believed in him, but... Because of the Pharisees, they were not confessing him for fear that they would be put out of the synagogue, for they loved the approval of men rather than the approval of God. Uh, today we come to the second part of this uh, chapter. Uh, a lot's been going on, and a few weeks ago, from this chapter perspective, Jesus raised Lazarus from the grave, and then after a couple of weeks of going off to a secluded place, he comes back and there is this uproar. There's an, there's an excitement, uh, partly and mainly actually because of the fact that it's the Passover celebration uh, for that week. Everyone is returning to Jerusalem in their pilgrimage, traveling miles and miles, leaving behind their, their home and, and spending a week celebrating the Passover celebration, where on Friday it culminates uh, with the slaughter of thousands of lambs. Blood is just flowing through this ravine, this, uh, this, this valley, uh, as lambs were being slaughtered, being offered up as a, as a, as a remembrance, as a memorial of the time when God passed over is, uh, Egypt and killed all the firstborn, those who did not have the blood of the lamb on their, on their home. So, they're throwing a huge, as it were, a welcoming party. It wasn't planned. It just kind of happened. Uh, palm branches were laid on the floor where Jesus was coming in. They're expecting a great warrior who will lead them to victory. And Jesus knows that. He knows what they're expecting. So he purposely tells his disciples, go and get a colt, a donkey, a young donkey. And it's very lowly. It's not very impressive riding a a donkey. And so he rides that in, but people just don't really care. Uh, they, they're excited that, that this is the time when there's a man who, who, who might be the Messiah will lead them to victory and, and lead them out of the Roman oppression. While everyone is festive, verse 27 says, My soul has become troubled. And I'm sure the people around them were confused. Everyone is rejoicing. Music is everywhere. They're shouting Hosanna. And as the Lord is in the temple teaching, suddenly he just stops because his, his human soul is shaken up, literally stirred and, and, and just pushed back and forth because he knows what's going to happen in about four days. He'll be uh, betrayed. Uh, he'll be brutally, uh, physically um, uh, tormented and, and hurt, uh, and then he'll be placed on the cross. Uh, and, if, and if anyone thought that 
being sacrificed on the cross, I mean, uh, on the, in the physical sense was bad. There's, the worst was yet to come where he would become sin and the Father would unleash his wrath on him in justice. And so the Lord, his soul, has become troubled. And as we l- learned uh, last week and a few weeks back, his prayer was not to have that trial removed. His prayer was that by going through the difficulty, the Father's plan will be fulfilled. And because that prayer was so filled with the desire to fulfill the plan of the Father, the Father, as we read in verse 28, uh, 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 responds. It says, Father, glorify your name. And then the text says, A voice came out of heaven. I have both glorified it and glorified again. And then something interesting happens. The people who are listening to him as they hear this thunderous sound in heaven, when Jesus says in verse 32, I am to be lifted up, they, they, they knew immediately what he meant. At that time, being lifted up meant be lifted up on the cross to die. And we all know Jesus is not the first one to die on the cross. Okay, anyone who went against the Roman government would be placed on that cross on the road into Jerusalem. People would come in and see that man suffering and realize if they say anything bad about this government, they're going to be up there too as an example. And so they naturally ask the question, what are you talking about? Okay. Verse 30, Jesus answered, The voice has not come for my sake, but for your sake. Now judgment is upon this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. And if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. But he was saying this to indicate the kind of death by which he was to die. And then verse 34 begins, So the crowd answered him, or basically it's saying they questioned him. They're like, what? No, we heard out of the law, that the Christ, okay, the King, is to remain forever. How can you say the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? Okay. They knew and meant the cross, and so they naturally asked the question. Now, what they're really saying is this. Are you really who you claim to be? Because the, the Son of Man that we've heard of It's going to live forever. And here you are saying that you're going to die soon. So who exactly are you? Now, as we take a look at these texts, we're going to see three things. Okay? This is what John is trying to explain. He's trying to explain, number one, the urgency of the gospel. And number two, the reason for judicial hardening. And number three, the intolerance of compromise. As he writes what Jesus says to them, he's explaining these things. He's he's explaining the urgency of the gospel, the reason for judicial hardening, and the intolerance of compromise. Okay? And that's our chapter breakdown uh, for verses 34 to verse 50, and we'll focus on maybe the first two today. So let's focus in on verse 34, the urgency of the gospel. The urgency of the gospel. So the crowd answered him. Now keep in mind okay, that they've been listening to what Jesus has said. So when they answered him, we have heard out of the law. To them, they, they were taught from the Old Testament that the Messiah was to remain forever. So when, they, when, it, when the text says they answered him, they're basically really questioning him. They're saying, we don't get it. What, what, what are you saying? Are you, are you different than the Messiah that we are expecting? The verses that might have come to their minds, and there are several, most likely are these three. Daniel 7, Daniel 7, 13. You don't have to turn there. I'm just going to read it off for you. Where it says, I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, With the clouds of heaven, one like the Son of Man was coming. And then toward the end, it says this, His dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away. So no mention of dying. 
And it ends by saying his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. And then you go to Isaiah 9, 7. It says there will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace. And in Ezekiel 37, verses 20, verse 25, it says they will live on the land that I give to Jacob, my servant, in which your fathers lived, and they will live on it, and their sons and their sons' sons forever. David, my servant, will be their prince forever. Notice that none of those verses mention anything about the death of, Jesus, death of their Messiah. So naturally, the Jew would think that when the Messiah comes, he will be, he will be a king on an eternal level. Uh, on one of my YouTube posts, um, there was this, uh, that, you know that YouTube, st was it, is it called YouTube story or Facebook story? I forget which one it was which. But there was one where it says, the Jews in Jerusalem are singing, waiting for the Messiah. So I clicked on it, and there was a live video feed of them all gathered together in Jerusalem, and they're singing some Jewish song, waiting for the Messiah, and I, my heart was broken. He already came. He already came and you missed, as it were, the boat. But notice that they were waiting for that king. And I'm sure many of them have, have, a, have the, maybe all of them, basically have the same perspective as, the, as these Jews that we read about in John 12. They want a king to come and deliver them a powerful king who will not die. So when Jesus said the Son of Man will be lifted up, they're saying, well, what kind of Son of Man are you referring to? Now we understand that there's a passage in, in, in Isaiah that talks about the suffering servant, but it's kind of like they didn't want to accept it. Okay? They didn't want to match that with their, with their king. So notice how fickle these Jews are. One moment they're praising his name, Hosanna, they're welcoming him into the, the Jerusalem city. And the next moment, they're doubting him just because Jesus said, you know, I'm going to be lifted up. Okay. Now, the Lord knowing that the people were quickly turning away, he's going to urgently proclaim the gospel again. Okay. And as he does so, what he makes clear here is that the invitation to salvation is limited. And that is our first sub-point under the urgency of the gospel message. Why is the gospel message urgent? Because the offer of salvation is limited. You know, when I was sharing with you about that Oprah Winfrey uh, interview of Carl Lake, uh, oh, I forgot to say it, Carl the pastor of Hillsong in New York City, he's saying that God welcomes all. He has continual love for everyone. There's no limit. In fact, you don't even have to be a Christian to have a relationship with the Father. That is completely different from what we learn in verse 35. Look at verse 35. Jesus said to them, For a little while longer the light is among you. Walk while you have the light so that Darkness will not overtake you. He who walks in the darkness does not know where he goes. Focus in on the phrase, a little while longer. A little while longer. Now we know that the phrase is a clear indication that there is, that he only has a few days with him and that's what he's saying. It's only, gonna, it's only going to be about four more days that I am with you. The offer of salvation through me is limited. And the phrase among you, he's referring to the physical aspect of Christ being with them for three years. I am the light physically among you. Okay. But this is only going to happen for a little while, literally a few days. And no one in that crowd thought that Christ would be crucified in a few days. I'm sure nobody expected what was going to happen that, fr that, that Friday, that coming Friday. They all assumed that this miracle worker would be there with them as he was with them for the past three years, just, just doing miracles upon miracles. 
They never conceived in their human minds that it might be only a little while longer before that light is extinguished. And the principle here is this. We must learn from this today that, they, that we must never ever assume that we are going to live for a long time. The tendency to presume this is arrogance and pride. And we have that tendency as men as human, as human men and women. By the way, those of you who don't know what the word presumption means, it means this, to think that we know something is true even though it is not for certain. For instance, we all think that we're going to wake up the next day and go through the daily mundane activities of life. We all think that we're going to grow up, get a job, get married, have kids, retire and see our grandchildren and live in a nice home. Now, it's not wrong to hope for these things, but there's a sort of a false expectation that it must happen. Now, when that kind of heart sets in, there's no longer an urgency to fall in line with God's will and to do His work. Notice what Jesus says to them, walk while you have the light. What he means is this, believe in me and follow me, walk with me while I'm here right in front of you, while you have the opportunity. This is an invitation to them to follow the light while he is literally in front of them. Because if you notice in verse 36, Jesus says, because even literally in a few minutes from now, I'm going to flee from you. I'm going to hide. Look at chapter 12, verse 36b. These things Jesus spoke, and then it says he went away and he hid himself. It's like the Lord saying, do you not realize what I just told you? I told you it's only going to be a little while, and he wants to demonstrate this, and so he just leaves, and everyone's looking for him. And notice that when they ask him the question, who is the Son of Man, he doesn't bother to prove that he is that very Messiah. Because in one sense, in Jesus' mind, there's no time to explain. There's no time to reason. There's no time to give an apologetic answer that he is who he is because he is who he is. Okay? He, he, he is God in the flesh and he, he, there's no, there's no um, reason for him to give any more reasons. He demonstrated to them with the miracles. They should have accepted him immediately at that moment. The only thing necessary at this point is to give them a sense of urgency to follow before the light goes out. What we're learning here today is that the call to repentance, the call of Jesus Christ to you to come to Him is never given indefinitely. The Lord does not hold open His arms wide and He, and, and he just waits and waits and waits and waits. In fact, He doesn't wait. He's ready to leave. The question is, will you be ready to follow Those of you who have not yet follow, followed Christ, this message is for you. It's an urgent thing right now that before you leave this service, you must follow Him. Those of you who are at home watching and you have not yet given your life to Christ, today is that day. It's urgent because He might take your life or He might flee from you. You, re- you don't hear this, Right? from pastors that Jesus will flee from you. It's always flee from sin, go to Christ. Well, we read here that the Lord went away and he hid himself from them. Those of you who do not believe in Christ, it is urgent that you realize this today, that if you do not turn from your sin, then the Lord will turn from you. 
And those of us who believe in the gospel, we believe in Christ, do you not realize that your life, must, your life is to portray a sense of urgency? We don't have all the time in the world to give the gospel. In fact, I want to say this. If you are a genuine, true, converted, you're real, you're, you are a real son of God, your life will inevitably reveal a sort, a sense of a, a sort of a sense of urgency. The urgency that Christ might come back at any time. The urgency that Christ might take our life before He comes back. The urgency that those around us might be taken before they have an opportunity to believe. See, as a true believer, we, we live with this paradox, right? This, this tension. One is that, that we just have to live. We have to go to work. We don't live with this panic in our mind that, oh, the world's going to end, the sky is falling. We just live normally, expecting the next day to come, and we go to work and we do our duties. But on the other side of this tension, this, this, this weight that we're holding, there is that sense that it can happen at any what? At any time. And by the way, it will come out in the way you pray and how you pray. This urgency that you, you're, you're praying for someone. Everyone's given up on them because it's been, what, three years and they're not a believer. And they don't pray for them as urgent as they should, but you do. Why is this gospel so urgent? Look at what Jesus says. So Jesus said to them, For a little while longer the light is among you. Walk while you have the light, so that darkness will not overtake you. Why is the gospel urgent? It says right here, darkness desires to overtake you. The word Overtaking the original means to seize and make one's own, to take over in a hostile sense. It's saying that Satan and his cohorts and all the demons of this world and the systems of this world, it is hostile against souls. You might be saved, but those who are not yet converted, they are targets. And if you are saved, you also are a target, the, 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 the king of this world, the, the lord of this life, will try to cause you to compromise and sin and fall into worldliness and laziness and slothfulness, lack of love. There's a battle over your soul. And the Lord says, he who walks in darkness does not know where he goes well, it's, it's a fact he's saying those who are in darkness don't know they're headed straight for hell meaning the people who live in this world according to this world they never feel a sense of urgency do they do you have, have you met anyone amongst your friends who come up to you and say oh my gosh today i feel like i'm gonna go to hell i better get my life straight no it's always like we have to remind them and we're afraid to remind them that they might be offended that, that we open their eyes and, and show them that you're heading into destruction. That's why you don't see unbelievers you know, scrambling to go to church. And the worst part is when you have people who do go to church or religious not scrambling to go to church. They just go because they, that it, they, ha because they have to. There's no fear of God in the world because too many pastors are saying God loves you no matter what. Did they not read John chapter 12 carefully? There should be fear. The fear that God might abandon me. That's Romans 1, right? And God gave them over to the lust of their hearts to impurity. And this is why 
when we pray on Wednesday nights, there should be a sense of urgency. We're pleading, God, have mercy. God, be gracious. Lord, please come and, and bless these sinners so that they might see and they might come to know you. So John explains in verse Verse 35 and 36, the urgency of the gospel message because the offer of salvation is limited. And number two, the presence of Christ is limited. Look at verse 36. While you have the light, believe in the light so that you may become become sons of light. These things Jesus spoke and he went away and hid himself from them. Now, Focus on that phrase, while you have the light. Okay? I submit to you, we don't understand this phrase. We don't understand this metaphor as Jesus is intending it. Why? We live in a culture where we are professional procrastinators. Raise your hand. Raise your hand. Please admit it. Okay? Please confess you are really good at procrastinating. You who've raised your hand, God bless you, you've, you've, you've confessed. Those of you who did it, you're a bunch of liars. <laughs> now everybody's like, you know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the seriousness of this issue just got, just got thrown out the window, right? Look, we live in a culture where procrastination is like part of a, our life now. We, we wait as long as possible rather than seizing the opportunity and and get it done as quickly as possible. If there's any kind of like a seizing of the opportunity is seizing to play that game, seizing to go to that sports activity, seizing to meet up with our friends, we seize that moment. But when it comes to something important, we wait as long as possible, especially when when it's around one or two in the morning. And then we complain we're hungry, so we get something to eat, and then we start studying around three. Some of you are really convicted because they're giggling really hard now on that corner over there. (laughs) Now, let me explain it like this. The people at that time that Jesus spoke to, when Jesus said, while you have light, they knew exactly what he was referring to. Because at that time, when it became night, there was no street lights. Once the sun went down, Nothing could be done. Even their little candlesticks wasn't bright enough to light their way. Work had to be done while the sun was up, and sometimes day, the daylight went so fast, and they were scrambling to get everything done before, that, before it turned completely pitch black. You know, today we have night light. Sometimes at night it's just so bright, right? that we have to even have to close our, our curtains and, and buy those extra thick curtains to just block out all the street lights. And for us, because we have those, those, those nice you know, amenities, right, these, these luxuries, we, we think, you know, if I can't get it done during the day, just wait till night. You just turn on that light and keep on what? Working. There is no urgency You feel like you have all night to get your work done and sort of waste a day. But people during Jesus' time did not have that luxury. Nighttime, for the most part, was completely pitch black and they knew the danger of trying to get things done in darkness. And the work that they did is not like the work that we do where we sit at our computer and just sit there. That If they had to do something, they had to go outside. And they could get hurt, or they can get lost. So when Jesus said, or Jesus says here, while you have the light, we need to understand it in that perspective. He's literally saying, why are you waiting when you know the sun is going down? You don't have much time. Quickly make your decision and follow me and not wait any longer before it is too late. So Jesus says, as we continue on in that verse, believe in 
the light. He's referring to himself so that you may become sons of the light. Again, to the unbeliever, the opportunity to believe in Christ is limited. The opportunity to believe in Christ is right now. And some of you have not yielded your life completely to Christ. Some of you, as you head home, that might be too late. And then to the believer, those of you who have been baptized and you profess your faith in Christ, you need to start living with a greater sense of the urgency of the gospel. The urgency to see the spread of the gospel, to, to see people come to Christ, to see your family members believe. You must start praying for them with, with a greater sense of urgency and plead that Jesus Christ will not hide himself from them. Because the text concludes in verse 36, these things Jesus spoke, he went away and he hid himself from them. Friend, one day the Lord will hide himself from you. And no matter how earnestly you might try to find him, he will not be found. That's why the text says, Seek the Lord while he may be what? Found. So John, the writer of this book, the Apostle John is explaining. His explanation, he wants to explain three things. The urgency of the message, the reason for judicial hearing, I mean hardening, and the intolerance of compromise. And so he's saying it's urgent. It's urgent because the salvation, because salvation is limited and the presence of Christ is limited, now he goes on to explaining the second aspect, and this is even worse. He's now going to give the reasons for judicial hardening, meaning he's going to give a theological explanation as to why God will actually harden a person's heart so that they will not even want to turn to Christ. And he gives two reasons for judicial hardening. Number one, the rejection of obvious grace. And number two, that judicial hardening is deserved. What are the reasons why God hardens people? Number one, because people reject obvious grace. Look at verse 37. But though he had performed, and you need to underline that phrase, so many signs. He's performed so many signs. And John tells us later on, he's performed so many that, you, that not even all the book in the world have enough space to contain what he's done and said. We will simply call that obvious grace. His grace was made completely obvious to people. And yet, the text says in verse 37, now John is explaining this, yet they were not believing in him. These signs, these miracles, were demonstrations of God's grace, his obvious grace. In fact, it was so obvious that the religious leaders could not deny it. In Matthew 12, 24, it says, when the religious leaders, the Pharisees, heard this, they said, this man cast out demons only by Beelzebul, the ruler of the demons. Notice that they're acknowledging that what they saw was true. They didn't say, oh man, this guy is fake. They said, you know what? He's performed a miracle. That's right, he did, but it's, from, it's with the power of Satan. That doesn't even make sense. Because that's why Jesus says, why would Satan cast out his own demons? He's saying, do you not realize what you just did? You acknowledged before everyone obvious demonstrations of power of God. It's obvious that I am who I am. In John 11, the chapter before this, he's, the, the Pharisees convened the council and says, what are we doing for this man is performing so many signs? And the most recent and, and most powerful demonstration of that was raising Lazarus from the grave. Again and again, the Lord made it obvious that he was in their midst, demonstrating 
who he was by the display of his power and authority over illnesses, disease, and even lifeless objects itself. He performed so many signs that were obvious, but they rejected it all. And John says, yet they were not believing in him. Why does the Lord harden their heart? Here it is. They completely and consistently reject all the grace God has given to them. Look at verse 38. That's what he's saying. He quotes Isaiah. He says, this, what is this? He's saying this rejection of God and this hardening of their heart, this is to fulfill the word of Isaiah the prophet which he spoke And look what he says here. He's quoting Isaiah. Lord, who has believed our report? It's better to say like this. Lord, who has believed our sermon? And to whom has the arm of the Lord has been revealed? He's quoting Isaiah, which was written hundreds of years before this moment. Because he wants to say this. It's been hundreds of years. It's been like that then. It's no different now. And for 400 years, God has been graciously demonstrating His obvious grace. When it says, to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed, that phrase, arm of the Lord, is basically another way of saying the power of God demonstrated in them through signs, wonders, and miracles. And he's asking rhetorically, and this is amazing, Isaiah is saying, who who received such Demonstrations of signs. The world? Gentiles? No. Only the Jews. And and if only the Jews, why don't they believe? The Lord didn't demonstrate this to uh, to the Egyptians. I mean, He did for them for that moment, but not in a constant, gracious way as He did with His own people. To whom? was given the greatest of all the grace of God, the demonstration of miracles. It's the Jews. To the Jews, the arm of the Lord was revealed. And they rejected it. They rejected the arm of the Lord. Why? What are the reasons for the judicial hardening of their hearts? They rejected obvious grace. And two, it's deserved. It's deserved. They deserve to be hardened. Again, you don't hear that today, right? Everyone says, I deserve to be loved by God. And pastors will say, and you are. It is such a lie. The text says, verse 39, this For this reason they could not believe. For Isaiah said again, verse 40, He has blinded their eyes. He hardened their heart so that they will not see with their eyes and perceive with their heart and be converted and I heal them. John is quoting Isaiah to say this. They deserve to be hardened because because they continually rejected obvious grace. Years of sending them prophets. Years of performing miracles and delivering them from, the, uh, from their enemies. Years of sending Christ to them physically for three years and they c- completely rejected His Son. So because they rejected all this and ultimately rejected Christ who was sent to them, the Lord judiciously, judicially hardens their heart. The Pillar of New Testament commentary says this, the inability of the people to believe is tied to Scripture's prediction, but that prediction of a judicial hardening, God Himself has blinded their eyes and deadened their heart. And the MacArthur New Testament commentary says this, it is a sobering reality that those who persistently 
hardened their hearts against God may find themselves hardened by Him. And in that commentary, he lists 20 verses in, in Exodus to indicate that God doesn't just harden his heart just on, on, uh, as, as like the initiative. Ten verses that state that Pharaoh hardened his heart and ten other verses that God hardened Pharaoh's what? Heart. Let me just read to you a few. Exodus 7, 14. Yet Pharaoh's heart was hardened. He did not listen. Verse 14. Pharaoh's heart was stubborn. 722, Pharaoh did not listen to them. Pharaoh hardened his heart. Pharaoh hardened his heart. And then if you go down, Pharaoh was stubborn. And then you go into God responding to that hardening of his heart, and God further hardened his heart. Chapter 4, verse 21, he says to Moses, I will harden his heart. Chapter 7, verse 3, I will harden Pharaoh's heart. Chapter 9, verse 12, the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart heart and you can read this in exodus chapter 10 through 14. you ever wonder what those nine plagues were for if you count the passover as 10 it was obvious acts of demonstration of god's power to the egyptians that they might repent but they did not All those frogs, locusts, river turning to blood, darkness, all of that was a sign of his mercy displaying to them, your idols are nothing. I have power over the world. Believe in me and repent. And yet they hardened their heart. Pharaoh hardened his heart. Every time Moses stood in front of Pharaoh and said, let my people go, that's preaching. Let my people go and come with us if you want. And he said, no. So the Lord hardened his heart. In verse 41, now John is trying to drive this point home to those who might read this. And verse 41 is amazing because he says, these things Isaiah said, because he, referring to Isaiah, saw the very Jesus I'm writing about now. You know what that means? In Isaiah chapter 6, when Isaiah says, in the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord. You might as well just put the word Jesus. I saw Christ. The very Jesus who is here five days before the Passover and the crucifixion is the very Jesus that Isaiah saw sitting on his throne. And you, in your history, your these ancestors, they rejected him while he's sitting on the throne. And you have done nothing different. So all of that rejection is deserved with being hardened. So John explains, okay, number one, there's an urgency of the gospel message because salvation is limited and the presence of Christ is limited. And number two, he explains the reasons for judicial hardening is because of the rejection of his grace and it's deserved. And thirdly, the intolerance of compromise. John is going to explain this, that you cannot think that you can live a compromising life and be acceptable to God. God will not tolerate it. Look at verse 42. It says, Nevertheless, many even of the rulers belie believed in him. Now, you stop there, you're like, Wow! Rulers are believing in him. Praise God. But then he goes on. But because of the Pharisees, they were not confessing him. Now, for everyone who keeps saying that John is a gospel of faith and all you need to do is believe, they're, they're not reading this verse carefully because it says here, the rulers believed. 
but they were not confessing. In other words, they didn't truly believe the way they ought to. Look what it says. For fear that, would, that they will be put out of the synagogue. Their believing in Christ is what we call dead faith or, uh, or, or demonic faith. It's a faith that will not save you. It's a compromised faith. It does not solely fear God, it fears man. And let's put it this way, fearing man means this according to this verse, loving the approval of your fellow peers more than the approval of God. Okay? Fearing men means you love their approval more than the approval from God. Look at verse 43. They love the approval of men rather than the approval of God. And God will not tolerate compromise. So number one, you must fear God. Okay? And number two, you must surrender to the Father. Look at verse 44. And Jesus cried out and said, He who believes in me does not believe in me. Now that's weird, right? Why Jesus would say that? If you believe in me, you're not believing in me. Like, <laughs> But in him who sent me, what he's saying is, it's, it's about the Father. The, the, I am the bridge to him. That's what he's saying. But when you put your faith in me, you're ultimately placing your faith and trust and surrender to the Father. It's the Father who's calling you unto himself, and I am that gateway. That's what he means. No man comes to the Father but by me. Let's clarify this, guys. Our faith in Christ must never be separated with the idea that we are ultimately believing in the Father and submitting and surrendering to Him. John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. The point is this. The whole idea of salvation is not just escaping hell. The whole idea of salvation and being forgiven is, being, is finding reconciliation with the Father of Jesus Christ, our Father who created the world. The gospel is a door to the Heavenly Father, and in that sense, through Christ, we surrender to the Father and we leave behind this world. Surrendering to Christ is surrendering to the Father. Seeing Christ is seeing the Father. So that's why verse 45 says this, he who, sees the, he who sees me sees the one who sent me. The intolerance of compromise. Okay? You must fear God only. You must surrender to the Father. Number three, you must leave darkness. 46 I have come as a light into the world so that everyone who believes in me will not remain in darkness. The purpose of Christ coming to the world is to remove people out of darkness. Out of darkness. How do we know when a person being moved by the Holy Spirit has true faith in Christ? When it's clear that you see from them indicating that they can see a distinction between their past life in darkness and their current life in the light. Okay. True believers are those whose eyes have been made open to the darkness that they were wandering in and they have left and, and come into the light. You begin to hate the valleys of this world. You begin to despise the system of this world. You basically don't love the world anymore. These men, they could not separate themselves from the love of men. So lastly, verse 47 to 50, you must obey the word. You must obey the word. Verse 47 says, If anyone hears my saying and does not keep them, 
I do not judge them, for I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. But notice what he says here in verse 48. He rejects me and does not receive my what? My sayings. He has one who judges him. Who? The word that I spoke. And who spoke that word? Who gave Jesus that word? It's the Father. He's referring to the Father. If you don't obey my word, the Father will judge you. Verse 49, I did not speak on my own initiative, but the Father himself who sent me has given me a commandment as to what to say and what to speak. And so we conclude in verse 50, I know that his commandment is eternal life. Therefore, the, the things I speak, I speak just as the Father told me. God will not tolerate compromise. There is an intolerance here. You must fear God only, not men. You must surrender to the Father. You must leave darkness behind and you must obey the word. So John explains to us the urgency of the gospel message, the reasons for his judicial hardening, and God's intolerance of compromise in these verses. I, I highly exhort you and encourage you, okay, if you have not surrendered, you need to do now. Okay, there's no do not think you have another moment. If you do live for another several years, I will predict this. You will become so hardened that you will never have a desire to turn to Christ and you will die in your sin and be in destruction forever. Turn to Christ now and believe in Him. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for Your Word. We thank you for such clarity. And we thank you, Lord, that, that it clarif it, it's a different message than the general public. It's so clear. We pray for those who are at that, at that point of decision that you might graciously y yield your grace again to them that they might turn and believe. And for those of us who do believe, Lord, forgive us for not living urgently to spread the gospel. Some of us have fallen prey to the, the delight and the luxuries of this world. And Father, help us to repent that we might live an urgent life to do your bidding. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.